sides of the story. Thank you so very much for joining us here on the evening edition of Both Sides of the Story. Hi, I'm Michael Anthony Cuff. This evening, we are going to be sharing with you the contents of a new book, which is titled Diary of the Seven Virgins, Our Journey into Awareness. It is a fascinating journey into self-empowerment. And, of course, um, as you would expect, um, uh, you know, I've mentioned a number of times here on this program just how Jamaicans from all over the globe are making their contributions from wherever they are. And this evening, we have online one of the authors of the book. He's Lloyd Richards. Uh, he's in Toronto, and he joins us by phone. Lloyd, good evening and welcome to the evening edition of Both Sides of the Story. Good evening, Michael, and I bring greetings from the seven masterminds, my <laughs> other six co-authors, and I want to thank you for having me on the call tonight. The pleasure is mine. Um, as we speak, may I take this opportunity again to congratulate you on the book and its contents, and uh, how is it doing? Thank you very much. Uh, the book is doing pretty good. We're having sales here in Toronto, book signings. Uh, the bookstores, they love when we come by and do book signings because it's just a mutually beneficial arrangement. We meet prospective uh, customers. We talk to them, share with them our story. They buy the book. We autograph the book. And the bookstores, they make money. I was in Jamaica a few weeks ago, did some book signings. So... It's pretty encouraging, and it's a very humbling experience, I can tell you. Yeah. The book is uh, intriguing um, right from the outset, because the way it's put together is, um, is quite novel. And may I ask you to just, you know, give us the, the story behind the book? Absolutely. The seven of us came together around about ten years ago from the perspective of pursuing a network marketing business here in Toronto. Now, we didn't quite progress in the business that we would have liked, but through the business, we went on a path of personal development, where we read lots of books from some of the great authors, the Eckhart Tolle, Dr. Wayne Dyers, John Maxwell, you know, Robin Sharma, and many other authors who we have read from. And through that, we formed a book club which is a slightly different from the typical book club because what we did is the seven of us would get together and we would individually review a different book with the intent to encourage the group to buy the book and to share some lessons from the book so we would grow our individual libraries. As that process continued, we turned it into a birthday book club because, as you know, anything you throw some food at it, it makes it even nicer. <laughs> it works so every time. Real good Jamaican food. I can stop with rice and peas, just cabbage, fish, Jamaican cake, and we, we eat, have a good time, and we do book reviews and give books as gifts. Around two, two and a half, three years ago, we came up with the idea of wanting to give back because we've learned so much from all the great authors we've read, and we wanted to try our hand at writing a book. We're all amateurs at it. So we, we have the finished product here, which was published in September, actually, and it is seven chapters we individually select a book that's impacted our life, share a bit about that book, some of the lessons we've learned from that book, and we've gone on to share some of our life experiences and some of the really powerful messages and lessons we have learned from our life experiences. Because we've really found out that everything in our life comes with a lesson. Every experience comes with a lesson. And more often than not, we're so close and caught up in the situation that we missed the lesson. Um, so that's the premise of the book, and each chapter ends with what we call virgin wisdom, where we highlight the key points we want to leave the reader with, and there's also a page for you to make notes for anything that you take away from the, from the chapter that's above and beyond what we have left you. And it's very intriguing because you're getting seven different perspectives from seven different writers, and the stories, some of them will make you cry, some of them will make you laugh, and others will make you think, yeah, I've been through that before. I can relate to this story. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm very excited about the book. We are 
very excited about what we have and we're just sharing it with the world and taking it one day at a time okay now lloyd give us a sense of what lloyd richards was like you know coming up in the early days uh, we know you were born here in jamaica and um you spent a part of your life here but uh, give us a sense of who Lloyd Richards really is. Oh, boy. Let me go mm -hmm. way back. So growing up in Spanish Town in Hampton Green, and it was I had a, what I would call a good life. And not realizing it until looking back, not realizing it then. And I didn't necessarily get to make decisions the way I wanted to make decisions. For example... I didn't go to the school that I necessarily wanted to attend. I didn't get to make life choices for myself. Now, no, I wouldn't fault my parents for that because I think they did the best job the way they knew how. I am the last of seven siblings, of eight, 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 uh, eight, eight children. And my seven siblings, they've set great examples for me. So I have every reason to want to do more to become a better person. Throughout my, my school days, I had you know, trouble with illnesses and asthma and lots of illnesses. Missed some of my exams as I did my, my back then GC O levels. But again, I could have used that as an excuse to just not pursue further. I ended up being um, a bookkeeper when I was here, simply because my dad was an auditor and that's the path I took because I just did what he said. I remember when I left Jamaica about 22 years ago, I immigrated to Canada, and I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do, but I'll tell you this, I was very sure about what I did not want to do, and that was bookkeeping. <laughs> I, did it, I did it because I was good at it, but not because I loved it or wanted to do it. And I pursued a three-year course at college here in Canada. Uh, as a systems analyst, I graduated after three years. And I've been working in the IT field ever since, and I love what I do, and I enjoy what I do because what I do is has to interact. I have to interact with people, and I love dealing with people, even though it is a technology-based profession. Okay. Now you said that you there were you were plagued with many illnesses throughout um, your 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 younger years. Uh, how how bad and how serious? Well. Asthma, as, as some of most people would know, can be very devastating. I remember nights when I'm being rushed to the hospital with my mom. And I, I tell her, Mama, stop. Don't even go because I won't make it. It was really bad. If I were to go to either the Spanish Old Hospital or the Chess Hospital in Kingston, they have probably have a file about 10 inches thick on me because I'm there almost all the time. Whenever I'm showing up, they have a bed just waiting for me. That's how I look at it. So it, it was it was pretty challenging. How did that but illness? Nonetheless, but nonetheless, you know, it's not an excuse to just give up. Okay. How did that illness impact the other activities, such as school? Well, I missed missed days from school. As I mentioned, I did miss some of my papers when I was doing my O levels, and I think from that perspective, there was. That was the impact there in terms of, you know, missing school often, being sick home and having to play catch up with homework and the classes that I missed and, and, and things like that. But again, you, you, you look back at these things and, and you recognize that they're stumbling blocks, but they are not the be all end all. You can move past them and still pursue your goals. You said you knew when you had a, the the power to choose for yourself a career, you knew one thing you didn't want to do, which was a bookkeeper. <laughs> your, um, the, was this was the was your decision to do bookkeeping um, your own, or um, were you influenced by others? Yeah, there was a huge influence. My father, wonderful man, he was an auditor for the Jamaica Library Service. Yes. And as such, he would travel the entire island, and he would audit the books for every parish library right across the island. I remember as, as a child in the summer, uh, through my holidays, uh, there was a couple times I remember traveling with him, two, two trips 
stand out in my mind. One, going to the St. Elizabeth Parish Library in Santa Cruz. I have a vivid memory of going through the mountains and the fog on that trip. And another trip in St. Anne, going to Manchanil with him. And I remember this, I have this vivid memory of him having a conversation with a, a gentleman on the beach. I was just standing there with him on one of the trips. So he influenced my life in that way. But it wasn't my passion. I enjoyed it, but it just was not my passion. Now you have moved a long way from that because these days you are a vice president with a Toronto-based IT firm and you're serving the Canadian finance industry so you know and, and this is a this is a profession that you chose yes and and just a precursor to that my role has recently changed a couple months ago from a VP into a director of uh, business development and sales. So my role has shifted a bit, but I'm still with the same firm. And and yes, it was my decision. So 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 the result, the end result is when you pursue something that you want, that you're passionate about. That because I've always wanted to learn about computers. And before going to college, I never ever used a computer, never had any knowledge. And I hung around the guys that knew a lot, learned from them while I did my projects with them and the, the, the professors and worked out well for me. Okay. Lloyd, we need, to, we need to take a break, so if you will just give us a couple of minutes, we're going to ask you to hold and we'll get right back to you. Thank you so very much for staying with us here on the evening edition of Both Sides of the Story. Hi, I'm Michael Anthony Cuff. It is my pleasure to be speaking with one of the seven authors of a book titled Diary of the Seven Virgins. Our journey into awareness. I'm speaking with Lloyd Richards, a Jamaican who now resides in Toronto, from which we are speaking to him. And um, Lloyd, I wanted to just come back by asking you, if you will, to pinpoint some of the pivotal moments in your journey to writing this book. Very good question, Michael. It, and, and I'll start by saying that my group, they're a phenomenal group. As we embarked on writing the book, I wasn't that excited about the book, to be honest. And I did what I had to do because I made a commitment to do it. And you said I you wasn't a very you. a valuable lesson just throughout the process of writing the book. And that lesson is to finish whatever you start. <laughs> you see, there was a point where, as a group, like every group, like every relationship, you go through challenges and turmoils, and, you know, as, as a result of that, there was one point I felt like walking away. And I didn't feel like completing what I started. Why is that? They, it's, I guess at the time... That's where I was mentally. And you see, it just speaks to the point where you never stop learning, you never stop growing. Because throughout the process of writing the book, I, I was and still am evolving. Now, there, there came the point where we were close to completing the book, pulling the chapters together, organizing the chapters, and getting the editing done. And as I looked at it, and I saw the finished product coming together, a fire was lit in me. And I was so excited that all kinds of things just went through my mind in terms of what's possible, where the book could go, and things like this. Interviews. I never really thought it was possible, but I tell you, when, when God opens doors, you can never, ever close them. Mm. So throughout the process of writing the book, I need to thank all my co-authors. Because individually, they have helped me to grow. Collectively, they have taught me a lot. And one, again, the solid lesson, and i tell you why that lesson means so much to me. My son is now 20 years old, and he's now pursuing a career as an electrician. And when he finished his first semester in college, he didn't necessarily want to go back because getting the apprenticeship 
just takes care of that process. But I said to him, no, finish what you started. Get the next semester done, get that certificate, and still pursue what you're going after. And it's a valuable lesson that I can share with others, not just for myself or my son, because throughout life, we may all start doing something. And it, it, it manifests itself in things like marriage, for example. When people get married, you know, it's, it's, nowadays it's so easy for someone to just walk away and, and quit without really finish what they started, which is a life together. Yeah. Let me ask and there you... there are many, many other examples. Okay. Speaking of examples, um, just run down for us the, the key moments that you share in your story, because the... That's one of the the unique features of the book, where where each each uh, the each co-author chronicles a journey, complete with um, with pivotal moments that that they would consider as defining moments in their lives. Yes. Now, for my chapter, I'll, I'll give you a, 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 a little bit more, a high level synopsis, and, and zoom in on a couple of key points as you asked. So for my chapter, there was a book that I read called The Saint, the Surfer, and the CEO by an author called Robin Sharma. And at, the, at that point in my life, there were some really positive lessons I learned that helped me to move past some challenges I was going through. And one of the lessons is that there are no coincidences in life. Everything that happens, happens for a reason. And every experience we have, it brings a lesson. And if you never learn that lesson, that situation will keep recurring in your life over and over again until you have the wherewithal and the presence of mind to learn that lesson, implement that into your life, and then move past it. It's just something about life that works that way. I further go on to talk a little bit more about the book, which I won't expand too much without giving too much away from the book. And then I share some of my own personal experiences. And there, there's one I'll talk about a, a, a bit in terms of emptying your bag. And, and that is your emotional bag. You see, throughout life, we all have many experiences with different types of people, family, friends, acquaintances at work, at home in the mall, wherever you go. And as you build relationships, people will disappoint you, people will love you, people will hate you. There's all kinds of experiences you'll have. And based on those experiences, you may walk around with past hurts in your emotional bag. What that does, it weighs you down mentally and emotionally. And if you don't learn to truly forgive and let go of those past hurts, you will continue to pile all kinds of hurts and negative things into your emotional bag, which will weigh you down and deter you from pursuing more positive things that you could possibly pursue. Give us an example, Lloyd, of a personal example of what you were just um, sharing with us. I remember when I was about 18, I had a really, really, what I then thought was a horrible experience in a personal relationship. I was literally dumped for no apparent reason through my eyes. And for at least two years, never was to see her, never spoke to her. If I'm going down the street and I see her, I take a detour just totally hurt and bitter but I wasn't hurting her I was hurting myself because I was traveling with that baggage and after about two years I was able to let it go have a conversation with her and truly forgive her and that helped me to lighten my emotional load and helped me to move past that stage of my life and to be able to move on forgiveness is a very difficult challenge for a lot of persons. How do you approach it? Well, first of all, I will agree that it's not necessarily an easy thing, but if you really make that commitment and you make that effort 
you can do it. There are, first you need to accept the situation as it is. Whatever the situation is, you need to accept it and realize that when someone hurts you or when they, they, they whatever it is that they do, most times it is never about you. It's usually about them and what they're going through in their lives. They will spill the venom of what their experiences are because they're hurting. They may be going through financial problems, personal problems, all kinds of different problems. And because they're hurting and they're bitter, they have nothing but negative things to say to you and, and, and possibly nothing to, to do negative things towards you. So if we just take a few steps back and if only we could figure out what's the reason why this person is behaving this way, what could be going on with them? I wonder what Michael's going through. Why did Michael call me such a bad name? I wonder why. And if we start thinking in terms of the other person and recognizing that most times when we're feeling hurt from others, it is because they themselves are hurting. Yeah. So if we exercise empathy and start thinking in terms of love and offering them, ask them, you know, is everything okay? Is, are you okay? Ask the inquiring questions, not just for the sake of asking, but with genuine care. You know, at age 18, Lloyd, we can be quite vulnerable in terms of our emotions. Um, to be dumped at 18, as um, I'm using your word, um, it must have really had a very, that must have been a very hard blow to your self-esteem. How did you recover? It was. It was a difficult time. And looking back, I, I, <clears throat> I have to say that that the Lord must have played his part in helping me through it. Because I don't think I was mentally equipped. I didn't know all the things I know now. But I know that growing up in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a Christian home and going to church, that God takes care of us when we can't take care of ourselves. It's like the story that's told many times over when we're traveling down the road and the Lord is walking with us and we see two sets of footprints and there's a time when there's only one set of footprints. We think that we're walking alone when he's actually carrying us when we're seeing the one footprint. So that is the only answer I can give to that specific time in my life, that he must have intervened. And I've seen many So he was carrying you. He's intervened. At that moment, um, you know, when you were most vulnerable, you're saying that you, you know, those are the moments when you're carried. But at some point, mm -hmm. he would have had to put you down. Um, now... How did you know you were ready to start walking again? You know when you can truly let go and truly have an empathetic heart and ear to the person that you perceive as done you wrong. When you can think of that person in a good way and think of, for example, their birthday, giving them a gift, or Christmas, giving them a gift, things like little things like that are clear indicators that you have indeed let go and you are looking at them from a position of love as opposed to hate, hurt and despite. Okay. Lloyd, I need to take a break again, so I'm going I'm going to ask you to hold on while I do that and then I'll come right back to you and we invite you to stay with us as well here on the evening edition of Both Sides of the Story. Both sides of the story. Thank you so much for staying with us here on the evening edition of Both Sides of the Story. Hello, I'm Michael Anthony Cuff. My guest is Jamaican Lloyd Richards. He's one of seven co-authors of a book titled Diary of the Seven Virgins. We're speaking with him from Toronto. Lloyd? Yes? What was the hardest part of the journey for you to write about? I think that breakup was probably one of the hardest things to write about because even though it is in the past and it's let, and, and you let it go, as you write, you, you relive that snapshot of your life. As you reflect and as you relate the story, 
it's something that you, you relive it. So going through that process, it was a bit difficult, but it was something that was, had to be done because a story had to be told. It had to be shared. The lesson had to be told. And I think that's probably the most difficult part of my story that, I'm, that I've shared as I, as I wrote my chapter. Have you found love again? Absolutely. Was the, you said it was difficult as you went through the writing of the book. Um, did you learn anything new about yourself? Yes, I did. It, 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 it made me understand the mindset I had when I was a teenager. And seeing where I was then and where I am now, it made me recognize the growth. It made me recognize things that I need not do anymore. It made me recognize things I need to get better at. So, for example, if I were to be in the same situation today as I was at 18, I would probably learn to let it go a lot quicker, not two years. Clearly, if, you're, if, you, if you love someone and you are hurt, you will go through a process. I'm not immune to that. But the process would be a lot quicker, and it wouldn't be so much a pity party, worrying about why me, why me, because I now understand that life happens, things happen in life. You expect to, to, to take on challenges head on and man up. Because one of the things I realize is, is, is that you, you're not in, everyone has challenges. If you're tall, you're short. If you're fat, you're skinny. If you're rich, you're poor. Everybody has problems. And sometimes we're so caught up in our own problem that we think we're the only ones with problems. And we see someone who's, in our mind, has, is having success. And we want their success. And we want their life. We, but do we, want, do we want their problems? You also shared... Or, I'm sorry, go ahead. Or are we willing to pay the price that they paid for the success that they're having. There is another experience you shared in the book, which I, if I had to hazard a guest, I would say that would have been the hardest challenge um, for you to, to write about or to relive. And that is, you've had a near-death experience, haven't you? Funny enough, it's not, it wasn't more difficult for me. I, I'll tell you, even at at the age of 15 when I had that experience as I look back and I remember how I handled it it was it, there's something about about the way I think in terms of not necessarily harping on the past or, or, or being being caught up in, in the situation so, so there was something in me from then that allowed me to quickly understand what had happened accept it, and quickly move on. For those who are not with, familiar with it, could you quickly walk us through it and then speak to it um, from, the, from the new perspective you have now? Well, there was a situation that I had a um, minor operation that went really bad, very quickly, and I flatlined. Nails went blue, heart stopped, dead, so to speak. I was revived and woke up in an unfamiliar room, which is the intensive care. I didn't know what it was at the time, but that's what it was. I asked about why I'm here, what is this place, and the nurse was hesitant in telling me because she, she thought I may have taken it really badly. But as it unfolded, I she told me what, it, what happened, and she told you that you had. She told you you had died. To just have yeah. Yeah, so, so it was. It was one of those things where, even though it could be perceived as a really tragic situation, and it was, it was. But for some reason, at that age, at that time in my life, I didn't didn't dwell on it. I accepted it quickly and just kept going. Whereas, in the other situation, it was. 
more devastating for me. The one where and you... I believe it has to do with matters of the heart where there is emotions attached. There can be more feelings attached to that. And that's probably where the difficulty came in, one versus the other. But, you know, the, this this experience that you, you talked about where you you actually flatlined, in other words, or you died, uh, you you know, you know, that is, um, you know, that is one of those situations that um, would uh, would usually shake up or shake to the core, um, you know, especially at age 15, because you wouldn't have had a chance to, you know, reflect on things like death and dying. So... You know, I, I would imagine that um, you know some degree of anxiety, tremendous anxiety, would have accompanied that that occasion, um, unless unless, for example, maybe you you know you contemplated something like suicide, uh, but you know um, you know uh, on that particular breakup. But uh, you know, you, you, I just listening to you, if I'm understanding you correctly, you're saying that um, the br- the the breakup was even more difficult for you. Correct. Yes, it was. <laughs> I never ever thought. I never. Thank the Lord for that. It brought my entire life. I've never thought of suicide as an option. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it was. Hello. Yes. Yes, it was uh-huh. more difficult to handle, and it's 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 just what it is. I, I'm not sure how to expand it any further in terms of one versus the other because. I, I clearly remember both, and that was more difficult for me. Yeah. Well, I, 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 you know, if I could just quickly share with you, I also had a flatline experience. So, I mean, I, I can, you know, and, and I, even though I was, I, it, it was quite recent, but at the same time, um, it's one of those experiences that um, is quite. You 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 somehow you, you tend to look at life differently after the experience. Did did you know? Did, did it change your outlook on life in any way? It did. It did. Uh, ever since then, I've, I've I've always considered myself as being on overtime, so to speak. So <laughs> yeah. So so the whole idea of fear of many things that I normally would have been afraid of, it's not so much because you've been to the edge and back. So worrying about a lot of different things that people worry about, worry about death, worry about all different kinds that we worry about, it's a little bit easier for me, just a little bit. Not, and again, I'm not immune to those types of problems. I do worry on occasion. I think that probably helps to mold who I am today in terms of quickly recognizing where if something, if, if I should go through an experience now that's possibly devastating, to quickly come to grips with the reality mm-hmm. and go through that process where I understand the reality, I look at what it is I can do to start resolving it. I, st- I quickly move to solutions mode. That's one thing that has worked well for me. Okay. I wanted to ask about the the word virgin in the title and how how is it that you would like the reader to understand it? Now, we've got a lot of questions on that, so that one that one is, uh, is, is it's about the mental virginity, about the fertile mind that's untapped, untouched, unexplored. Most of us just go through life living one day at a time, not necessarily making deliberate steps to carve and orchestrate our life to be exactly the way we want it. We, we, we just go through life. We don't necessarily make specific plans to say, well, I want to achieve this goal, and I take deliberate steps to achieve those goals. That is where the virgin mind comes into play. As you explore all that's available for you, the the different tools that we've learned, all that we've learned, it just opens our mind to a whole different world. And by doing that, 
is when you go about losing your mental virginity. So a mental virgin is someone who has never spent the time to explore all that's available for them and to discover their life purpose. Okay, we're going to come back. We're going to come back after this break to quickly explore um, some of those purpose, those life purpose, uh, when we come back from this break. So please stay with us one more time as we invite you as well to stay with us when we come back for more here on the evening edition of Both Sides of the Story. Thinking about getting a sumptuous treat? Then head down to Jack's Master Bakery. They stock bullers, raisin bread, and other baked products. Jack's Master Bakery, 73 Red Hills Road, Kingston 10. Telephone 925-7203. Professionals of mouth-watering baked products. The time by Jack's Master Bakery is... 8.31. Today's weather brief is brought to you by High Pro Feeds. High Pro Feeds, your partner for profitable production. High Pro Feeds, it's the one we've come to know. It's so good it we know. I eat with trust. Using high, high profits, man, it works for us. It's so good it we know. I eat with trust. A hard-working team behind the scenes. It's so good it we know. I eat with trust. Quality feeds for your broilers, layers, cattle, fish, and pig. I eat with trust. High Pro Feeds, it's the one we've come to know. It's so good it we know. I eat with trust. High Pro Feeds, your partner for profitable production. It's so good it we know. I eat with trust. Now for today's weather brief. A trough is across the Western Caribbean associated with an area of low pressure north of Honduras. Tonight should be partially cloudy with isolated showers. Tomorrow morning, look for isolated showers across western parishes. In the afternoon, look for windy conditions along the south coast. For the next three days, look for sunny conditions in the mornings with isolated showers during the afternoons across hilly inland areas. The information for today's weather brief was supplied by the Meteorological Service of Jamaica. Today's weather brief was brought to you by High Pro Feeds. High Pro Feeds, your partner for profitable production. Both sides of the story. story. We're back with you here inside the final segment of the program, Both Sides of the Story. I'm Michael Anthony Cuff. Along with me this evening is Lloyd Richards. He's speaking to us by phone from Toronto, a Jamaican who um, is one of seven co-authors of a book titled The Diary of the Seven Virgins, Our Journey into Awareness. And it's a book which examines some key values and lessons of life as seen through the eyes and experience of the seven writers. Lloyd, of the values that you that you use to to navigate your life's journey, which of them do you hold most dear? That's a tough one. But what I will say is there's something that I've been using recently over the past, say, three to six months that has helped me to stay grounded and to... To, to stay focused, and is recognizing that as an individual, I control a few things in this world, and the only things I truly control are things that concern myself. More specifically, two of them jump out at me, what I say and what I do. I have absolutely no control over what anyone else says or does, and because I've gotten a good grasp on that, it helps me to have realistic expectations of people. See, by, 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 by remembering that, it also helps to keep me grounded. Not expecting that because I think someone should operate in a certain mode of operation that they should do that. It also helps me with what I call, what I say, what I do, linking together. That, for me, helps me with my integrity. Mm-hmm that what I say and what I do are the same, and that as I go through life and as I talk about things and as I do things, my actions will speak for themselves and they'll be tied directly to what I do. So that in itself is one lesson, one, one most recent thing that 
has helped me and it's it's something that has become a talking piece for myself when I, I meet others because sometimes I remember just recently I I was speaking to a very, very old friend of mine. I haven't spoken to her in many, many years, probably over 20 years. And one of the things I realized that is that there was some stuff that she was going through. And her expectations of the other person was not necessarily what they're doing. And, and so she expected them to operate a certain way. And I shared that with her. Say, you know, here's something that's worked for me. And I also shared something else with her in terms of listening with the intent to understand where the other person is coming from. Because listening is one of the biggest challenges that we face as human beings. We tend to want to talk all the time. And one of the lessons I've learned several years ago is that I had to make a very, very conscious effort to listen more than I speak and listen with the intent to understand the other person's point of view. Because once I understand where the other person is coming from, and once I can say to them, you said this, this, and this, tell me if that's what you mean, then they have a clear understanding of what you think they're saying. They can agree with you and confirm what you said, or they can clarify. That aids to better communication. So those are two aspects of the listening aspect and the having a realistic expectation of others such that I can now manage my life and stay focused and stay grounded. Yep. Where in the in in the in charting your personal journey did you place the the the, the value of self acceptance? Did you speak to that? Is there anywhere in the book that you address that particular aspect of self? Self-acceptance. Well, it tie, it's tied to the whole forgiveness. Because if you realize that... Pardon? Go ahead. Yeah. Well, if you realize that forgiving, it's never ever about the other person, but it's always about you. And when you forgive, you are actually releasing yourself of the burden that you're carrying and accept the situation. And, and then once you recognize where you are and you see the areas that you need to start growing, because this is all a part of the process. It's all a part of the recognizing and becoming aware. See, there are generally four stages that anyone goes through with, with, with as they move from an era of ignorance into knowledge and expertise. And it doesn't matter what it is. At first, you're totally unaware of what you don't know. Then you become aware of the thing you know. So it could be something in your life and you're now aware of what that thing is that needs to be fixed. So that's your second stage. The third stage is where you start making some deliberate steps to fixing that problem or improving in that era aspect of your life. But you're still thinking while you're doing it. And the final stage is, the stage of mastery, is where you are just doing the things unconsciously. Think about driving a car. When you just started learning to drive a car, you were thinking about where the gas pedal is, where the clutch, where the brake, where the windscreen, everything. You're looking at all the controls. You're looking and you're feeling your way and you're you're second-guessing yourself. As you progress to become a better driver and more experienced driver, and once you have mastered the art of driving, you'll find yourself driving from work to home and, and not even remembering how you got home. Mm. Similar concept. Yeah. How good are you now, Lloyd, at facing reality? I'd say for the most part, I, I can grasp reality pretty quickly. Again, I, I'm not immune to some things, and there'll be that odd time where I miss what my reality is or, or not recognize it. But because of all the stuff that we've, I've learned from, my, from the authors I've read, from all my mastermind group, and, and, and still learning, it, it, I can quickly grasp my reality and accept it in a, in a very quickly. And again, it's still a process. There's still a lot more room to go because you never, ever ever stop learning if you want to continue that you always there's always room for improvement always always room to, for growth how but important that, is 
grasping the importance of reality when it comes to trouble, trouble, you know, shooting, uh, troubleshooting the, the challenges that one encounters in life? Well, it's, it's, it's extremely important because if, if you're not aware of what your true reality is, you won't even be aware of what, what your real problems are. And you may even start finding a solution to the wrong problem. What do you say? Your, you what would you say your true reality is? Well, if you, for example, let's look, let's look at relationships. For example, if you're in a relationship and it's not working, and you think it's not working because of something the other person is doing, and the true reality is that you really need to work on yourself because you're not a good listener. For example, and everything you're your party, your, your 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 partner says to you, or your wife, husband, or girlfriend, boyfriend, everything they say to you, you totally take it out of context, and you don't even pay attention to what they're saying. Therein lies the problem: yeah. communication, yeah. and your listening is the key part of what that problem yeah. is. Yeah, coming out if of you that, you never recognize that, then you'll never be able to resolve it. Coming out of the big hurt at age 18, Lloyd, um, what are you doing differently this time around? This time around? Yep. I'm spending... Uh, first, first things first, you take time to know people. Oh. And you never rush into a deep relationship without spending the time to know the person. That's a very important thing. Well... And I think that's the key. That's the key to the whole thing, eh? Oh, I think. Okay. And you said you have found love again, have you? Yes. Yes, I have. Wonderful. Um, I want to commend you and the um, the other seven virgins <laughs> for writing the book. Uh, <laughs> Michael, if I, I did, did there's one other thing uh, I wanted to touch on yeah. very briefly sure. before, before we, we, we sign off. And it's, it's another aspect of what we're doing as a group. A charity aspect of it is very important for us because we believe in giving back and we believe in helping. And we're putting together a mobile technology training unit for, for Jamaica. It's going to be like a mobile computer lab. It goes to the schools, primary schools, basic schools, where the schools that they don't have access to computers. And it will visit those schools for a semester at a time where the students can go in and get trained on computer skills and whatever classes that it would normally take. As a result of that, we're, we're looking at a, a couple different ways to uh, raise funds to sustain that program. And one is to have an adult training in the evening that adults would pay and that would help. The big picture one that we're, there's a big push is a reggae concert in Jamaica. The target date is Thursday, March 27th at about 7 p.m. 2014. And we're making a big push to try to get in the annals of the entertainment industry and locate and, and get on board some of the big name artists who people show up to, to, to listen to and to hear perform. And there are certain parameters that want to ensure that are maintained throughout this process. One, a non-smoking event. And I found out a few weeks ago that Jamaica has put some laws in place for that. So kudos to them for that. Two, non-alcoholic event. And three, uplifting lyrics. So that's where we're looking to do. We're looking to find artists who, who are willing to work with us, partner with us, and donate their time for one day. Okay. Uh, and we're putting together a business plan to get the charity off the ground, a proposal to send off to specific um, corporations in Jamaica, banks, media houses to, to, to partner with us on this because this venture is for the children. It's not about us. It's about us doing something for the children and to assist and play our part in improving our country. Okay. Well, let me again, Lloyd, say congratulations and thanks to you and uh, the six other co-authors of the book for really just, you know, allowing us to explore, you know, providing channels through which we can explore the true essence of meaningful living. And um, through your book, Diary of the Seven Virgins, Our Journey into Awareness. And yes. um, the book, and, is the book available really in Jamaica? Where, really where in Jamaica is the book? I'm sorry? Maurice, I really want to name them by name. Sure. Maurice Burnside, 
Maurice Burnside, who grew up in Spanish Town with myself, Fitzroy Grosset, who grew up in St. Thomas, Amatas Fungay, who grew up in the Cameroons, we adopted his, him as a Jamaican as well, Peter James, who grew up in West Milan, Angelita Barneswell, who grew up in Western Kingston on the Waltham Park area, and Curly Bennett, who grew up in Guy's Hill, St. Catherine. I want to thank them all for the work they did, because without them, we wouldn't be where we are today, and I wouldn't be the person I am today. I want to publicly thank them, because they have played a major part in my life, and have helped me to grow and become a better person, though the process is still going on. Still ongoing, but I want to thank them. Okay, Lloyd. Thanks again, my friend. You take care now. Okay. okay thank you very much for having me. God bless. Bye-bye. And speaking of names, uh, Carrie Ann Reed Henry, thank you so very much. And we'd also like to say thank you to Sandy Saunders and Floyd Wright. And as always, my biggest thanks of all, I reserve for you. I'm Michael Anthony Cuff. Good night.